get started. Okay, so um, all right. So today we'll um, we'll talk about a classification method called support vector machines. Uh, we'll introduce the uh, the topic today, and then um, uh, and we you know we won't finish. We'll uh, we'll have to finish on Friday. So because on Wednesday you guys have a, a midterm exam. So, um, so I'll introduce the topic today. Uh, we'll cover the kind of the basic form of support vector machines. Uh, and then um, you'll take your uh, exam on Wednesday, either at 10 a.m. or 10 p.m. California time. So uh, your choice, up to you. And, um, and then uh, we'll continue the, uh, the topic on Friday. OK, so um, support vector machines. Um, it's got this cool sounding name, but um, you know, the, at least conceptually, I, I guess it's pretty neat. But uh, but you know, when you when you draw it on a, on a piece of paper uh, for the two D case, it's really it, you're just drawing a line here. Um, but uh, but the name sounds uh, sounds really cool. Okay, um, the simplest version of support vector machines is the maximum margin linear SVM. Okay, the maximum margin linear SVM, uh, and that's the uh, the one we'll focus on uh, today. This is kind of the simplest uh, idea, and um, and the idea is that you've got uh, data that are linearly separable. Okay, um, so um, for our example, we're going to look at two dimensional data, and so linearly separable means you can draw a line through the data, and it's going to separate one class from another class, right? So you get, you've got um, the class labels will be um, positive versus negative, uh, or you've got, you know, whatever these class labels are, your data exists in, you know, real dimensional, uh, in, in two-dimensional real space, and, uh, and linearly separable means you can draw a line, right? But you could also imagine data existing in a higher dim dimensionality, like three-dimensional space, five-dimensional space, whatever it is, and then you would be drawing a hyperplane, okay? You're going to draw a hyperplane. Um, and the idea here for maximum margin uh, linear SVM is that you're going to draw some parallel hyperplanes, okay? And both of these hyperplanes uh, will be able to separate the two classes from each other. And what we want is we want the distance between these hyperplanes uh, as wide as possible, okay? We want um, the distance between the hyperplanes as wide as possible. And so, um, um, so I'm going to show you some examples of uh, points that are linearly separable. And then we're going to show, I'm going to show you uh, also plot some parallel hyperplanes, okay? And, um, and then the region between these parallel hyperplanes, the parallel hyperplanes will be dotted lines. Okay, uh, the region between the parallel hyperplanes is known as the margin, and we want the margin to be maximized. Okay, and then in between the mar uh, in between the um, parallel lines, you'll have a line in the middle, and that's going to be your SVM boundary. So uh, okay, so here are some points, and these are linearly separable in that we can easily see, like I can draw a line right here and it will separate them, right? But we've got different potential candidate lines, like I could draw a line that's almost vertical, I can draw a line that's very uh, angled, okay? Uh, and they would still separate um, the blue dots, the positives, from the uh, the red dots, the, the minuses, okay? So the uh, the, the data points have been represented with either plus or minus signs, and um, and we can draw uh, we can imagine different boundaries here that would uh, separate separate these. Okay, so I'm going to just show you some some. Okay, and uh, and basically every boundary you pick, you can pretty much find um, you know a parallel one. So if I pick uh, a line that looks almost vertical, okay, I've got two. Uh, I've got two hyperplanes that are parallel, okay? In, in two-dimensional space, the hyperplane is just a line, okay? So I've got two lines that are parallel, uh, and I've got these two dotted lines, and the distance between these uh, is known as the margin, okay? And, uh, and I'm going to show you some other lines that could work, 
uh, as far as boundaries that separate um, the, the positive cases from the, from the minus cases, okay? And, uh, and we want the, to pick the, um, the one that, uh, that maximizes the margin, okay? So here's uh, an, another one. It's got a slightly wider margin. Here's another, okay? And um, here's another case. And this one is probably gonna be the widest margin that we can achieve. Um, and as I go on, um, we can see, all right, so this also counts. These also count as boundaries. This, this will count as a boundary that separates the positive from the negative. And I've got two parallel hyperplanes shown by these dotted lines that kind of satisfy, right? If I draw a hyperplane here, I'm still separating the positive from the negative. If I draw a hyperplane down here, I'm still separating the positive from the negative. But we can see that the margin here is a lot smaller than say the margin here or here, okay? And this is probably the biggest margin. The, these are still fairly wide margins, okay? But uh, probably not as wide as this, and this one's pretty good, but also probably not as wide as this. Okay, and these are obviously much, much smaller margins, and um, and so you you got kind of a a range of hyperplanes that could work, um, but what we want is we want the one with the minus widest margin. So this is the one that we're going to to pick. Okay. So uh, which hyperplane boundary that we pick? Um, it says to pick the one that maximizes the margin. Okay, the margin is defined as the um, perpendicular distance from the decision boundary to the uh, closest points on either side. Okay, and the, um, so, so we have, um, Okay, um, so, so the points that are closest to the, um, um, to the boundary is known as uh, these, um, the, the margin is the distance from, uh, from here to here, okay? Uh, the margin is the distance from basically the two parallel lines and the dots that are along, um, along these dotted lines are known as the support vectors. So the closest points to the decision boundary depend on the decision boundary that's chosen. Closest points are called the support vectors and they will lie on the margin's edges, okay? They're gonna be called support vectors because you can change the location of the other data points and the location of the boundary will be, um, will be unaffected, okay? As long, um, as long as the support vectors remain the closest points to the boundary, the, uh, the location um, the location of the boundary itself will be unaffected. So um, let me just kind of show you what I mean, right? The, the closest points depend on the decision boundary that's chosen and that they are the support vectors. So, um, so right here, the, um, the closest points are these three dots. If we chose this boundary, okay, if we chose this line as our boundary, then these three dots would be the, uh, the closest points and if I chose um, if I chose this boundary, then these three dots would be the closest points um, right here. You know, only these two dots are the closest points, and things like that. Okay, so depending on the boundary you choose, will determine which points are the closest, and the um, um, as long as if these are the three closest points, then where these dots are, and where these dots are will have no effect on the, um, the selection of the boundary. I could add more blue dots down here and down here. Uh, and I, in fact, I think I have a uh, kind of a picture of this, right? I could add more of these blue dots here. Uh, I could take away some of the red dots. I could add red dots. And the decision boundary would remain the same, okay? So we can add or remove points other than the support vectors and the, uh, the boundary won't change, okay? There's not, um, I can't pick a, another um, boundary that's going to have a wider margin, okay? So, so these, um, 
the three dots or whatever the dots that are um, closest to the boundary are your support vectors. And as long as these are um, the closest dots, then uh, the location of the other ones don't matter. So these are the support vectors because they basically are the, the values that support um, and define uh, where the boundary goes. All right, so, um, so that's what we've got there, okay? Um, and what we are doing is we are going for maximum margin linear SVM, okay? And so in our case, uh, I've circled the support vectors and then the margin is shown in purple. The margin is the distance um, between basically uh, this hyperplane and the hyper this other hyperplane. So we have the two hyperplanes, parallel hyperplanes that, um, um, and basically you have one that goes right up against um, the nearest uh, positive point, and you have another hyperplane, parallel hyperplane that goes right up against the nearest negative point. Okay, and the margin is the distance between them. Okay, so it, it the margin is going to be the perpendicular distance between. Um, uh, is the distance that's perpendicular to the boundary itself. Okay, if you have basically a non-optimal boundary, then the um, the margin is going to be uh, smaller here. Okay, so um, so the, what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to um, uh, maximize this um, mathematically, okay? And um, what we have to do is um, we're going to define our training data kind of in the form uh, we've got n data points and uh, we've got our input vector x and each input vector is labeled with a class label t, okay? So either t is either going to be um, positive one or negative one and um, uh, and each x is going to be uh, you know a d-dimensional real vector, okay? And so um, the uh, the maximum margin is uh, is going to be the uh, the group of points, um, or is going to be the boundary that separates um, the ones with class label plus one uh, from those with class label negative one, okay? And what we want so that is that the distance from the hyperplane to the nearest points um, is maximized. Okay, um, you can describe a hyperplane. Okay, you can describe a hyperplane as the set of points that satisfy some sort of equation. Okay, okay, the equation being w transpose x. Okay, minus b is equal to uh, some value zero. Okay, so. Um, so if you say, um, basically, w if you say W transpose X has to equal some constant, that will create some kind of um, hyperplane, okay? It's going to be basically the set of all X points, okay, that satisfy um, the equation that W transpose X is equal to some constant, okay? And in that case, uh, you know, W is going to be a vector that is going to be um, normal or perpendicular to the hyperplane that you create. Okay. So, um, you know, for example, if, uh, if you've got the set of points x1 and x2, and if you say um, uh, if w is 1 and 1, okay, you're going to basically say uh, w is 1, 1, which is, you know, imagine uh, a point at the origin and a vector going to the uh, the point one one okay um, so that would be uh, kind of um, a it's going to be a vector that's normal to the the hyperplane so if you say uh, w um, transpose x so the vector one one times x so basically just you're adding x one and x two together has to equal some constant you know let's say you choose the constant to be um, five then you're going to get a, a line that basically connects um, the point zero five to the uh, um, to the point uh, five zero, okay, and everything in between two and a half, two and a half, uh, three two, and two three, and so on and so forth. You're going to get uh, a line that is uh, is perpendicular 
to the uh, the vector one one. Okay, and any other vector you choose for w, um, the set of points that um, that satisfy uh, w transpose x is equal to some constant in this case, or which can also be written as w transpose x minus b is equal to zero, um, is going to be um, basically a a hyperplane that is perpendicular to the uh, the vector w. Okay, and so um, so when we um, look at the uh, these parallel hyperplanes here, okay. What we're going to say is that W transpose X um, minus B for uh, for all of these points will have to be uh, positive, okay? Um, and we're going to say it will be at least positive one, and for everything on this side will be uh, negative one, okay? So we're going to say W transpose X minus B is equal to one for anything on the positive side. W transpose X minus B is negative one for anything on the negative side, and um, and what we want to do is we want to find uh, the W that um, will kind of will form the uh, the maximum margin, okay? And so, uh, and then next few pictures we're going to let x1 and x2 be the closest points from each class to the to the boundary, and so they will lie on the edges of the margin, okay? So this is this is kind of our picture, and what we've got is W transpose x. Um, um, it says plus b, it should say minus b, but it doesn't matter. b is just some constant, okay? w transpose x plus a constant is equal to zero, uh, and that's going to form this, um, that's going to form this line right here, okay? So this line is um, going to be your boundary, and the dots, for the dots on the edge of the margin, okay, it's going to satisfy the equation that W transpose X plus B is equal to positive one here. W transpose X plus B or minus B, whatever, whatever plus a constant um, is equal to minus one, okay? Um, for everything along this boundary here, okay? So we've got uh, this boundary, which will form um, uh, kind of the minus one boundary and this will be the uh, the plus one, okay? And everything uh, when it's equal to zero will be right along the boundary, right? So if, if you happen to have a new data point and it's right on the boundary, um, it's gonna get classified as, it's gonna have a value of zero and it's not gonna get classified as either positive or negative. But, uh, but this, is, this is what the, uh, the diagram would look like, okay? And so, um, what we're going to do is we're going to say that the vector that joins two of our closest points, so we've got a point right here and a point right here, this one we'll call um, you know, x1 and x2. The, um, the vector that joins these two points is, uh, is this blue arrow here. Okay? So we've got a vector that joins um, the two closest points, that's this vector. And if you um, project it onto the direction that is perpendicular to the boundary, then that will be, um, that's, that's the, uh, the dot product, and that will give you basically the length of the margin, okay? So the, um, the margin is this purple vector, okay? And that is the result of projecting or taking the dot product between this vector, the vector that can, um, that joins um, the two closest points onto the direction that's perpendicular to the distance here, or just perpendicular to the boundary, okay? Even if I were to take, um, um, if I were to select this point and say this is the closest point, uh, these are the two closest points, because these, both of these are the closest points. Even if I were to pick this one, the vector that joins this one, when I project it down onto this, um, this direction, it's going to result in the same um, same arrow here. Okay, it's going to result in the same distance, and that's going to be the length of the margin. Right? So I, I hope you guys remember this from uh, I guess linear algebra when you take the dot product of two vectors. Okay, uh, it's going to be the result of projecting one vector onto the other. All right, so. Um, 
So this is uh, what we're going to say is we're going to say let x1 and x2 be the closest points from the two classes. Uh, the vector joins uh, this vector x1 minus x2 joins the points x1 and x2. Uh, with the way the boundary is defined, w is a vector that's perpendicular to the boundary and w over the norm of w is going to be the direction that's perpendicular to the boundary. Right? Um, we're going to arbitrarily call the length of the margin uh, to be uh, 2 gamma. We're going to say 2 gamma is equal to the length of the margin. And so if you take the dot, if you dot the vector with the direction perpendicular to the margin, then you're going to get the length of the margin. So that's, this is what we have here. Okay. All right. So if I, um, we're going to say, uh, kind of using our definitions, we're going to say w transpose x1 minus b is equal to 1, and w transpose x2 minus b is equal to negative 1. And so we're going to go ahead and expand this. So this is the length of our margin, and I'm going to distribute the w transpose and get w transpose x1 minus w transpose x2. Uh, and then here I can just add, um, because it's a difference, I can add the same constant to both data points. Okay. And um, and this we've said is equal to one, and we're going to say this is equal to negative one. Okay. And so when I um, add these together, I'm going to get one plus one, which is two. Right. So here I basically have two. We'll cancel that with this two, and we're going to get the uh, the distance of the margin, or half of the distance of the margin is one over the norm of w. Okay, so whatever the norm of W is, that's going to be um, one over that's going to be the uh, the distance of the margin here. Okay, so that's what we want to do. We want to maximize the uh, the margin, and uh, and so this is where we are. Okay, and so because the norm of W is in the denominator, maximizing that distance gamma is going to be equivalent to minimizing the norm of W. Right. So um, we want to find the W that's going to have basically the smallest norm, but we can't just pick any W, right? Because W still has to satisfy the constraint that when you draw it, okay, that all of the positive points end up on this side and all of the negative points end up on this side, okay? And that we need to pick it so that um, that basically um, this when you evaluate evaluate it, this, this is going to be equal to zero, and then for the closest points, we get plus one, and then for the closest point on this side, we get negative one. So it's still, um, so we, it's subject to a constraint. So we want to find the W with the smallest norm, but we have the constraint that W transpose X minus B is greater than one, greater than or equal to one for all XIs that, um, that are, have a positive class label, and we also want W transpose Xi minus B to be uh, negative, uh, negative one or more negative for all Xs where the class is negative, okay? And um, a clever way to kind of su summarize both constraints into one equation is to take the product uh, of one or negative one with basically this part. So if I do Ti times W transpose X minus B, okay? We have to say that this thing has to be greater than one, okay? Greater than, greater than or equal to one, um, and that that will work for both the uh, the positive and the, the minus side. Okay, so um, if you remember, I don't know. Uh, I think from thirty two A, you have a constrained optimization. Uh, and you can do that using uh, Lagrange multipliers. So it might, might have been a while since uh, we brought in uh, Lagrangian terms, um, but, uh, but this is what we want to do, right? So we're going to minimize this value, uh, the norm of W, and, um, and just kind of, I guess for the sake of the calculus, it's going to be a little bit easier to minimize um, uh, basically the, uh, the norm squared um, uh, over 2, okay? And, um, and it's subject to this constraint, um, which is going to be, which has to be satisfied for all of the observations, okay? So that the constraint that, um, 
that everything gets classified correctly has to has to be met for for all of the data points. Okay, so all of the data points have to at least be classified correctly. So um, so we can do this using Lagrange multipliers. And so the way it works is you're going to add a new term uh, for each constraint that you have, right? So you add, you add a new term to your objective function. The objective function is you know the function we want to minimize. We're going to add a new term for each constraint that we have, so that the optimum of the kind of the new objective function will correspond to the optimum of the original constraint problem. And um, and so we've got um, we're going to have n. We're going to end up having n Lagrangian terms, one for every single observation. So every observation basically has a constraint, right? Basically that uh, when you throw the uh, the observation in against the boundary, it's going to end up on the correct side, OK? Um, so you know every observation has to satisfy this, this constraint. So we're going to have n Lagrangian terms to add. And so the objective function, which is what we're trying to minimize, this, this W transpose W is equal to um, basically the, uh, the norm squared. OK, so this is the thing we want to minimize. We want to minimize the norm squared, OK? But we have all of these Lagrangian terms to satisfy, and, and there's a total of n of them, OK? And um, so, so this is what we have, OK? And um, you know the, uh, the book goes and expands this out further, but it, it arrives at this conclusion that just says, there's no closed form solution, OK? And so, um, so we can, at least we can set up our problem, OK, as a Lagrange multiplier problem. And we can um, do some more math to kind of, I guess, simplify it even further. But uh, but unfortunately, there's no closed form solution. But um, but you can find a solution kind of iteratively using the computer, using quadratic programming. Now, I never learned quadratic programming, and um, and I tried to look it up just like on a quick tutorial on how to do quadratic programming. But it was uh, it was way more complicated than I wanted to learn. So, um, so I don't know anything about quadratic programming, but apparently this is how um, it can be solved. So you can solve um, this Lagrange multiplier problem using uh, quadratic programming. So I'll take the book's word for it, um, and I guess other people's word for it, that this can be solved. Um, no closed form solution, but via quadratic programming. Uh, okay, so I've already shown this um, this picture here. Okay, uh, you can do uh, SVM with R, and uh, and basically, if you take you know the data points, this is kind of what the plot will end up looking like. Um, uh, the support vectors get their own special symbol, and it draws the boundary and says these are the ones that are labeled plus one, and these are the ones labeled minus one. And this is kind of your decision boundary. And, um, and this is supposed to look like basically, um, I think I, I try to use the same data points here. Okay. And so when I when I plot this in R, this is what it what it produces here. So this is the um, the support vector machine classification plot um, using R using this is uh, available in um, this package here. E1071, and you just create a SVM uh, fit by using SVM much like a LM, and um, and you do it here. Okay, and here I just plotted it. Okay, so one thing about the uh, the support vectors is that you know as long as you have these points, uh, so here's the support vectors, and you can change add points out here, take away points, and and it's not going to affect the boundary, okay? But as soon as you stick a point somewhere inside the margin, that's going to affect the boundary. And so, so here uh, I added a uh, a point here, okay? I just added this point, and it dr dramatically affected the boundary, okay? And uh, and maybe uh, you know that's that's what happens when you use what we call a hard margin SVM. The hard margin says everything, when you draw your linear boundary, everything has to be classified correctly. You cannot have points 
that are on the wrong side of the boundary, which um, uh, which is okay. Um, but you know, if I if I move this any further this way, like if I put the blue dot here. Then, set, then we won't be able to draw a, you know, then the dots are no longer linearly separable and we cannot draw a hard margin classifier uh, boundary between, um, between the, uh, the positive and the negative cases. So, um, so one thing is we can um, ease the constraint, okay? I'm gonna finish a little early here. Um, so the maximum margin classifier um, uses what's known as a hard margin, where we say that um, you know the the sign of the the label multiplied by basically um, the the decision boundary line has to be greater than or equal to one. Okay, and uh, and this value one represents the distance from the boundary, which is you know that this center line to the nearest point, okay, which is uh, to the nearest points, which are along the dotted line, okay? And, and this distance from the center line to the dotted line is, um, is that distance one, okay? And the constraint is called a hard margin because all of the data points in the data set must satisfy this property and, and its distance has to be at least one. So everything has to be all of the data points have to be at least at the margin or farther away from the boundary, okay? Uh, what we can do is we can relax this constraint, okay? And we can allow for some points to be closer to the boundary, uh, that center line, than one, right? So you have the, the dotted lines. The dotted lines from the center to the dotted line represents the distance one, and we can say that distance uh, for some of the points, the distance can be less than one, okay? And so we're gonna say xi, this is um, the symbol xi, lowercase xi. Um, we're gonna say um, each, each dot, xi sub i, uh, has to be, um, each data value will have its own xi, and it has to be greater than or equal to zero. And, um, and, the constraint will be this, okay? And so if xi is a value between zero and one, then point i, um, I should be zero is less than, okay? Um, then point i is within the margins, okay? And if, um, if one is, if uh, xi is greater than one, then this point i is actually on the wrong side of the boundary, okay? Meaning that uh, that when I do this, I end up actually uh, greater than some negative value, okay? Now, ideally, ideally, and, uh, and I didn't finish typesetting this, okay? Ideally, all of, you know, if we can satisfy the hard margin, okay? Then, um, then all of the xi's would be zero, okay? Zero is ideal, but we can allow for the, some of the xi's to be uh, greater than one and misclassify a point if it means having some other good properties, meaning like if the, uh, the w that we end up choosing ends up having, um, you know, being um, kind of having a, a smaller value here. So, um, so what we wanna do is we still wanna minimize this, Okay, this is basically uh, the norm of W, okay? And we also want to minimize basically the sum of all the xi's, okay? Because all of the xi's, um, if all the xi's are zero, we've satisfied the hard margin criterion. Um, if the xi's are slightly bigger than um, zero, then, uh, then they are, then you have points within the boundary here. Um, so this is the distance one. If you have a, a value in here, then you've got a distance that's less than one. And then if you have a, let's say a blue dot over on this side, then you've got um, you know, a, a misclassified point. And that might be okay um, if, uh, if it means having basically 
um, this thing to be small, right? And so basically we have two things that we want to minimize. We want to minimize the sum of the xi's, okay? We also want to minimize the uh, the norm of w, okay? And so this is kind of like the uh, the regularization where you've got kind of two objectives. And so you've got some term c that balances uh, which objective is going to be more important, okay? So if c is a very big value, then um, then then it's going to be more important to minimize the um, um, the xi terms, and you um, you know basically if c is uh, um, very large, then um, then you basically have hard margin SVM. Okay, but as you relax um, your term c, you're allowing for for more and more um, uh, what we call a softer margin. You're allowing for a softer margin, and you're allowing for more points to be either misclassified or within the um, within the uh, the margin. Okay, so so these are all. Um, so this introduces the concept of just allowing for points to be within the margin or for points to be uh, within uh, on the wrong side of the boundary, which will be important because the idea of having um, linearly separable uh, data is not going to be um, met very often. Okay, it's so it's okay for illustration, but in real life, uh, you you won't always have data point data values that are linearly separable, and so uh, allowing for a little bit of flexibility and allowing for points to be misclassified um, uh, is going to be important. Okay, but the idea overall idea of still trying to maximize basically the uh, the margin um, but now we're allowing for kind of uh, some some misclassifications because we're, we're loosening the uh, the definition um, or the constraint um, is but the original idea of trying to find a boundary that maximizes that thing is uh, is still going to be the case okay um, that's all I've got uh, for you guys today. We'll, uh, we'll end a little bit early. And um, uh, I think I forgot to give you the uh, quiz answers. So it is uh, seventh week Monday. The quiz answers are D and A. Um, D as in dog for the first question. A as in apple for the second question. So D as in dog and then A as in apple. First question D, second question A. Okay, um, that's it. We'll end, uh, we'll end a few minutes early today. Um, good luck as you guys study for uh, your midterm exam. And, uh, and again, you can choose to either take it at 10 a.m. Or, uh, or 10 p.m. And um, uh, we'll see, it says, uh, can I make it to the live lecture? Is it okay if I'm on Zoom using my phone? Yeah, uh, yeah. If for whatever reason your laptop doesn't work, you can use the Zoom on your phone. That, that's fine. Okay. Yeah. Just uh, log into Zoom somehow, either on your phone or laptop or whatever. You know, laptops probably make the most sense if you can use it. But um, but if not, you know, log in from your phone. That's fine. Um, okay. So we'll uh, we'll end there. Good luck as you guys study and. Um, and we will see you on Wednesday, either at 10 a.m. or 10 p.m. California time. So whatever time that is for you and your local time. And then, um, uh, and then I'll see you guys uh, on Friday, and we'll uh, we'll continue talking about SVM here. Okay, um, we'll see you then. <laughs>